Hello, my name is Kelly Caldwell and I'm the lead instructor at Stanley Community College's Instructor Training Center. This is going to be a lecture on one of the many modules in the different courses inside of Cisco Networking Academy. I'm going to cover many different items in these particular lectures, uh, starting with CCNA, going possibly all the way through DevNet. But to begin with, one of the things I want you to know is I'm, I go with a good enough philosophy, and that is no lecture is perfect. So in other words, if you're in the classroom with me, uh, we could be interrupted by a person knocking on the door, you know, my phone could ding, your phone could ding. I'm not going to have perfect lectures and therefore my recorded lectures will not be perfect. You may hear my phone ding, you may hear a phone call start during one of the, the lectures and I'll pause the lecture and then start back over. I'm trying to give you a good enough lecture to help you learn the materials. I also want you to know if you are not taking classes at a Cisco Academy, in other words, you're watching these videos on my YouTube channel and you're not trying to participate in an actual Cisco Academy, I strongly recommend that you go to www.netacad.com, scroll all the way to the bottom to where it says Find an Academy. I'm going to put in here uh, the state uh, city that we are in, so um, in case I am in Albemarle, NC, North Carolina, as you can probably tell by my accent, but you'll see here Stanley Community College, and if you click here, you would get the information on what courses we offer and how to get in contact with us and how to actually see our offering. So if you are in an area and you would like to find your local school or Cisco Networking Academy, then go to netacad.com, scroll to the bottom and do find an academy. I strongly recommend that you get involved in the Cisco Networking Academy because it is a wonderful, wonderful program. Last but not least, enjoy, learn and grow. So enjoy these lectures, learn from them, grow, if you want to grow in the IT field, that's excellent. Or if you just want to learn new things, that's even better too. We hope these lectures will be useful for you and that you will be able to use them to increase your knowledge in the IT field. Hello and welcome to our um, lecture on module one of Introduction to Networks. What we're going to do today is take you through this very first chapter, which is a basic welcome to networking and how networking works, how it affects our lives, some common networking topologies and networking types how we make uh, networks reliable and some of our trends, along with some of the ways that you can use this to look at moving forward as an IT professional. If you're a Cisco Networking Academy student, then one of the very important things that are available to you is the Packet Tracer program. It is a simulation engine that is available for you. And in fact, as part of the new Packet Tracer 8 that has been rolled out, there are a lot of what do we call a rack and stack or physical mode capabilities that have been designed to help during this COVID crisis when you cannot get inside the classroom and touch the physical equipment. So one of the first things you will see in any 7.02, and you'll notice this is a 7.02 Introduction to Networks class. One of the first things you will notice is that in each one of those at the very beginning, you will see um, these videos about what Packet Tracer is, how to set it up, how to get started with it. And then there's also this very first packet tracer, which is how to do uh, logical and physical mode exploration. I'm actually gonna open this one up. It takes a good while for packet tracer to open these because the, a lot of these uh, PTPM or packet tracer physical mode exploration uh, are big files. So it's actually only available on packet tracer 64 bit version. So be aware of that. But when you download this, there's actually a really nice packet tracer that's available that will show you the difference between logical and physical mode and the expiration in it. And as soon as it pops up, I'll come back to this and show it to you. But let's think about how networks affect our lives. First off, let's be honest. Every single thing is networked today. We all have phones. We all have tablets, computers. Um, we have TVs connected to the network. So everything is connected to our networks. A network is typically consi consist of several different components. Now, what I tell my students, and one of the things I like to say, and I'm going to use this high-tech thing called Notepad. Don't laugh, it still works. But when I talk about the parts of a network, I talk about something to share, okay? A media or a medium, and the last but not least, some type of protocol. So first off, what are we gonna share? Now this could be anything from files, okay? It could be music, it could be, uh, you know, 
videos, streaming videos, all right? We need a media or a medium for that to go across. Now, the reason I don't just say media is because, of course, we have coaxial cable, um, you know, coax. We have unshielded twisted pair cabling. By the way, if you don't know what those are and you're just watching this video, you will learn as we move forward. Unshielded twisted pair, shielded twisting pair, twisted pair, fiber. But we also have microwave. We have RF waves. Okay, so we have wireless. That's why I say media or medium. And last but not least, we have protocols. And these are the rules for hosts to communicate. You can understand this lecture because I'm speaking English, even though it's Southern English, but I'm speaking English and you can, you understand English so you can understand what I am saying. So we have rules for communicating. If I go, huh? Even though you don't really know it, you know that's a question because I have a rising intonation at the end of that. That's a, uh, an unspoken rule in, in our English communication. In order for host on a network, and that's one of the things they mention here, they talk about host being clients or servers, but for this client to talk to this server, there has to be some type of rule, a way for them to talk to one another, for it to grab email or access web services or access file services. All of those are rules. I'm gonna jump back real quickly. The packet tracer is opened up. So here's the packet tracer. In this particular packet tracer, it actually shows you two different sites uh, that are connected via an underground um, submarine cable. It actually asks you to, to uh, drill down into sewer, drill down into the branch office, and then drill down into the actual wiring closet where you will see the wiring closet here. You also can look at a logical layout, and this is how the devices are logically connected to one another. So Warrington, Oregon being connected to the sewer to Alaska via these two underground fire rodnet cables. Hopefully in the real world, we'd be doing more than just fast ethernet between those two, but that, that's what's being used here to get to the router at the moment. But in this particular setup, it actually has you go through and connect cables to the individual uh, computers and uh, connect them to different ports. And then you can actually, depending on if you put it in the right port, which I didn't put that one in the right port, um, you're able to get uh, actually be scored and show you different items on here. So when you do a check results here, it can show that I did not place it in the correct port. Um, so suppose going to LS2, I went to LS1. So I can actually close this. I should be able to go in here and click this cable. Oops, I keep clicking the wrong cable. Click this cable here and I can move it to the other. But right now I'm just gonna grab it and move down to LS2 if I can get my hands on it. There we go. And now you can see I get the points. So. I, 16% complete because I did the very first item, which was connecting via a straight through cable, this PC to this rack. You also in this mode can drag components over and connect them to the rack. You can right click on them and look at inspect the rear. So you can actually look at the rear of this device to look at the console or to connect to the console. So they've added a large number of, of, of physical mode enhancements to Packet Tracer. Now back to our types of networks. For first off, peer-to-peer. -peer. These are networks that have no centralized administration. All the computers can be both clients or servers. They are very easy to set up. Um, this is the kind of network you would have if you connect two PS5s or two um, Xboxes together and, and game together like we used to back in the days of LAN gaming. Um, you, know, you didn't have a centralized server, you didn't have a centralized service. Now uh, we have more centralized servers or centralized, uh, what are called server-based networks. But in a peer-to-peer, -peer, it's very easy to set up. It's not complex. It's not costly because you don't have servers that can be upwards of 15 to $20,000 a piece. And you don't have to hire network administrators and we don't work cheaply. So that's one of the things that makes a peer-to-peer -peer network so much easier and cheaper. There are disadvantages to peer-to-peer, -to -peer, though. One is there's no, there is no centralized administration, and there's no centralized security. So there's no way to be absolutely secure because each individual computer is responsible for the security policies on that computer. It's also not very scalable. We say that in a peer-to-peer -peer network, you should never have more than 10 devices on it. The opposite of a peer-to-peer -peer is a server-based network. And server-based networks, something similar to this, would have a centralized server. It would have the ability to 
um, do centralized administration. It would have a, a fairly large server here that is being controlled by an administrator. Typically there's more than one server and all of those ads in cost, but you have centralized admin, centralized security, and it is a more scalable model, the server-based network model. Peer-to-peer -peer is easy, but not very scalable. When we talk about end devices, here we're looking at one of the neat things about the Cisco curriculum is it does have animations to kind of show you how data moves through a network. Here we have the fact that you know, messages can be put out. And in fact, what we can do is if it's a large file or something of that nature, we segment it into smaller pieces. And then even those individual pieces can take different paths across the internet network, which is typically the internet or our local network, depending on how big our networks are. And we can go from an end device, which would be a PC to a PC. Now our intermediary devices are those networking devices that move traffic. So again, as we replay this, you'll see this switch has to make a decision about where to send this particular packet. Then this router has to make a decision of where to route this particular packet. All of this, you're gonna learn how these devices make these decisions, but these are intermediary devices. And then they are network devices such as a LAN switch, can zoom in here a little bit, a LAN switch, a router, a firewall appliance, a multi-layer switch, which is really just a switch that has the ability to do routing also. And we sometimes call multi-layer switches layer three switches. A standard switch with no multi-layer switch capabilities is called a layer two switch. You will learn what those layers are later, but layer two is the data link layer. Layer three is the network layer but you're gonna learn about the OSI model on those layers as we move through this course. And then the wireless router is being represented. And many times a wireless router is what you have at your home. Here's the media or some of them that are available. We have an entire chapter later, by the way, folks, that talks about media and the types of media, but it can be copper-based media or we've got strands of wire that are twisted around each other. Um, it can be shielded like this, the bottom one, or it could be unshielded like the top version. Fiber optic cables, which come in these large bundles. Um, by the way, in fiber, you always have to have a send and a receive wire or a, a glass fiber for each one. So that's why you see them always in uh, two, uh, twos, because one's for send, one's for receive. And this is our media, the wireless, the medium. So we can use RF signaling, satellite, microwave, et cetera. One of the cool things about the Cisco Academy curriculum are these check your understandings, which is the following is the name of all computers connect to a network that participate directly in network communication. If you would say host, you could check it and it would tell you whether or not you got it right or got it wrong. So data encoders, pulses of light, that's fire rod to cable. Which two devices are intermediary devices. That would be a router and a switch. Check it and I got them all correct. So it will let you read the material and then give you a little quick way to check your understanding, which this is new with version seven of the curriculum and I really, really like it. So as we draw our network diagrams, um, so you saw exactly this here, when I go to logical, you can see that these are switches, access points, servers, all of these are standard icons used in the Cisco curriculum. So end devices are shown by these standard icons. Intermediary, intermediary devices are shown by these standard icons, and there are others, but these are the main ones. And then down here is what we use to show wireless media, a LAN media, which this is what we mean Ethernet by this, and we're going to talk a great deal about Ethernet. Uh, but Ethernet, uh, and this is WAN media, which is typically a point-to-point -point serial connection of some sort, or possibly frame relay, or uh, MPLS or something like what MPLS typically is over, over uh, layer two or excuse me over um, Ethernet. But um, that's a, a WAN media. We'll talk a little bit more about that. That really is not as prevalent in the new CCNA or the new CCNA certification. So we don't see that a great deal in the curriculum anymore. Here's our topology diagrams. Here's a physical diagram showing how things are physically connected and where they're at. So these are in a particular rack and on a particular shelf. Whereas the logical diagram shows you more of the networks, how they're logically connected to one another and how they are um, broken apart using different uh, networking addresses. You're gonna learn how to actually subnet and how to break networks into subnets 
and into logical networks as part of this course. All right, so what are some common network types? One is a SOHO, small home network, which is, or just, excuse me, just a small home network like you would have at your house, which by the way, it's funny how we call them small networks. But if you were to do a quick inventory on the number of devices at your house, you would probably find that you're upwards of 10 to 20 devices in your quote, small home network now. When you consider phones, computers, tablets, um, IP cameras, all the different things we have, direct TV boxes, TVs, you're gonna, it's really amazing when you start doing uh, the, an inventory, the number of devices that we have just in small home networks. We then have small office and home office networks. So it can be very small networks like this. Then we got medium to large networks all the way up to huge worldwide networks, which are multiple sites for corporations who uh, maybe exist in different countries. The two we talk mainly about are LANs and WANs, local area networks. And also another way to remember this is I call these limited area networks. They are, the, the actual acronym is local area networks, but you can also think about limited. They exist in a limited geographical area. So they may be on a single campus in a single building. Um, we do other, have other ones like a MAN, which is a metropolitan area network. So it's a, a network inside of a single city. We have a CAN, which is a campus area network, which they don't mention here really. And then WANs, which are wide area networks. They are worldwide, they have no geographical barriers. Here's an example of multiple LANs, these small local area networks connected via the cloud, or this would just be the internet to themselves or to one another. And that would be the WAN connections going out there. So remember, local area networks, limited, wide area networks, worldwide, huge. One of the things we say too is that WANs typically connect LANs. So that's another way to think of it. The biggest WAN, by the way, is the internet. It is a collection of LANs. That's all the, the, the internet is. It's a large collection of all these networks together making up the internet. A couple other concepts that are mentioned here are intranets, and those are um, networks that are within a particular company. So if you have an intranet, it's a private connection of WANs and LANs belonging to an organization. An extranet can be a series of connections that you have to other vendors or suppliers or customers you work with. The crazy thing is you have to be very careful when you're connecting your intranet to extranets because you're extending your security boundary out to other networks that you trust. So people are very careful about doing that. They don't want to, to, to expose their internet or their company network to security flaws that could be found in a supplier or customer. However, in order to make things work, many times you have to have connections to extranets. So be aware of that. It's just a, a dangerous, somewhat dangerous thing to do. Types of internet connections. Obviously we have DSL, cable modems, cellular, satellite. Um, I honestly am just waiting for Starlink in my area because there's no good fast internet where I live. Um, so I'm waiting for Starlink's uh, satellite that is fast and has uh, low uh, latency. Dial-up telephone, there are still some people that are on that, unfortunately, but very few. Um, but that's, you know, we all, that's where I started, was with dial-up internet back in the days of Genie, believe it or not. Business internet connections can be dedicated lease lines, Metro Ethernet, which is really a lot of times what we call dark fiber. You just, you rent a piece of fiber from a service provider to connect um, either to a service provider or connect two of your sites together. That's what we do here at our college. We actually rent a piece of fiber um, that connects one of our, our main campus site to one of our secondary campus sites. Business DSL, which is what my wife's business use, uses to get fairly fast uh, internet at their particular business. And of course, satellite is something that's available. We do have, when we start talking about trends and we start talking about things that are important for our networks, we have um, in the past had a separate network for 
phone, internet traffic or data traffic, and for anything else, like even our security cameras or videos. Today, we have a converged network. Everything runs over our IP-based network, which has caused some problems because we have devices such as phones that need higher quality of service than someone just surfing the net, or we have video streaming that needs higher quality of service than, uh, service than someone just streaming on the internet. So we have to make sure that we have the ability to do quality of service to provide a stable, reliable network, especially think about when the phones are on the network and you expect to be able to call out and call 911 and, and make those calls in the event of an emergency. Reliable networks are built so that they are fault tolerant. In other words, they have redundant links. Um, they have the ability to recover from a single device failure. One of the things I teach is that you can build the most redundant network in the world but you can't afford it. Um, so as you increase redundancy, as you go more towards those 99.9999% uptime, you are going to run into cost issues. Be aware of that. But we try our best to build our networks where they can survive a single link or a single device failure. Likewise, we try to make them scalable so that if you need to add a whole new building, you can easily do that by jumping off of one part of um, your network that's been designed. If you suddenly had to add a large number of users, or let's imagine, hey, a pandemic takes place and suddenly everyone has to work from home. Your network has to be scalable enough to handle that kind of additional strain. Quality of service, coming back to what I said before, again, here IP phones, you know, voice over IP needs to have a higher priority and quality of service than just your typical web pages. So we have to have the ability to maintain what are called quality of service tags across our entire network and conceivably even out past the border of our network. But typically we usually lose all QoS when we leave the border of our own network. And last but not least, this one's huge, network security. Networks are being hacked left and right, folks. Um, so we're really trying to make our networks as secure as possible so that we can uh, provide this, what is called the triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So make sure only those who should see data see it, that data is not changed in transmission, and it's available. So if you go to access a, a resource, email, files, they're there and available for you. Real quickly, what are some trends? BYOD, people bring their phones, their own laptops, their own tablets. Problem with that is you're now responsible for those devices because they're on your network, so they become a security hazard to your network. So most of the time we're putting them out on their own VLAN and trying to shunt them away from our main traffic. Online collaboration, which has exploded along with video communications because of our entire need for um, collaboration and being in uh, online during the COVID crisis. Cloud computing, we'll talk more about that, but public clouds, private clouds, this is the idea that um, your compute and storage resources are being put onto these data centers in the cloud um, so that you have, um, you know, some people are building public clouds, or excuse me, private clouds that are just their own um, services in-house. Many of them are relying on public clouds like Amazon, Azure, and then some people are doing hybrid clouds and even community clouds. But this is the move of data and compute and storage onto the cloud. Trends in the home, again, more cloud-based with smart technologies. That's definitely power line networking, using power lines to help with networking. I totally ignored this and said, nah, nobody would ever use this until I had a student who was from New York City. And they said, here's one thing you need to realize. Yeah, you can use wireless where you're at and you're fine. But we live in an apartment building that with anywhere within our area, there's 10 to 12 other wireless routers. So we had to switch to a power line networking system so that we could have uh, enough connectivity, get, uh, connectivity to our devices. There was no free channel for wireless to make it usable. And I thought, huh, that's a good point. Never thought about that. And then wireless broadband, this is where we're getting more into 5G services. 
Um, you know, the hope is that 5G will be as fast as most normal connected networking services, or maybe even faster in many places. That's the crazy thing. At my home, my phone's 4G connection is faster than my internet connection is through my ISP. Um, so if I if uh, you actually had true um, limitless bandwidth on uh, your wireless carriers, I would actually switch to that for my main internet. But they're not truly, you know, unlimited plans. Once you get to a certain level, they they start to throttle you. Security threats, worms, viruses, zero day attacks, all of those are huge. The other things that's really big is uh, ransomware becoming much more of a problem, especially during this COVID outbreak. Seems like every day you're reading about another system that's been hit with ransomware. So what does all this mean for you? Well, we're wanting you, by the time you finish the three classes, Introduction to Networks, of which this is the first chapter, Routing Switching Wireless Essentials, and Enterprise network, Networking Security and Automation, we want you to go get your CCNA. We want you to pass your CCNA and then use those skill sets in the IT field. You're going to be able to do that if you read these materials, pay attention to these lectures, and then do all the labs and packet tracers. I hope this has been helpful. Have a good day, and I hope you'll be back for the lecture on Module 2.